Hi, Kitty Cats. I am Amethyst Deherrick, your hostess for Gender Identity Weekly, a weekly discussion about gender and identity from the contributors and guests of the Purple Paw Publications website, Gender Identity Today. This content is brought to you by subscribers of Gender Identity Today. If you are already a subscriber, thank you very much for your ongoing support. Uh, subscribers receive fabulous benefits such as so, uh, content delivered directly to their inbox every time it publishes, and the ability to interact with all of our contributors, including me, which, huh? So if you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as other podcasts, other videos, and all of our writing by our contributors, please consider subscribing using the links that you're going to find in the show notes. Voila. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> This is our second try, just, so, just to make that clear. So I am here, believe it or not, live and on location. Maybe not live, but on location. We're alive. Mm -hmm. I am alive. Mm -hmm. She is alive. <laughs> but I'm here at Starlight Studio with Julia Deverdi. Hello, Julia. Hello. Thanks so much for having me. I cannot tell you how excited I am to do this. So I know Julia. I don't know why I'm looking at them instead of you. But I know Julia from a long time ago. We, we started thinking about this. It might have been 2008, 2009. We're not too sure. Right. Well. Um, but it was like literally a past life for me because I was sort of, I had a different name, different presentation. Black hair. Black hair, mm -hmm. right? Still wavy, but. Um, and I know Julia. So Julia, I probably should have done a better introduction. Julia is the owner, owner boy. Julia <laughs> is the owner of Starlight Studio, as well as a very accomplished burlesque and belly dancer and an instructor of those to boot. It's and I can make a really good grilled cheese. Grilled cheese sandwich yeah. like yeah. nothing yeah. better. Those are my credentials. <laughs> so good credentials. So I wanted to talk to Julia because, I, I mean, I was mentioning before, growing up, like, my sense was that I was, my sense was that I was not allowed to dance. Some of it in part, of, I believe, were gender identity issues. Mm -hmm. But I know that there are, especially in the LGBTQ community, many of us have body dysmorphia, gender mm -hmm. dysphoria, or just in general, we feel you know we're, we're not allowed to do certain things mm -hmm. the, because of social expectations. Right. And we're already trying to lay low, right? Because you, know, you don't want anybody to know who you really are, right. at least when you're a kid. So what I wanted to talk to talk about with Julia is how dance can be used. Um, I'm also almost like a therapeutic, uh, therapeutically. Mm -hmm. So, so I thought that would be a good discussion. I hope anybody can hear us at all, but we'll find out. So, <laughs> so I asked you, asked you the question before, but I'm going to ask it again. Mm -hmm. When we first met. I didn't know that you danced at all. Mm -hmm. And you said that you started in, in your teenage years. So in actuality, I've been dancing since I was a child. Okay. But I started belly dancing when I was a teenager. Okay. And I started doing burlesque in my early 20s. All um, right. So it's been, it's been a journey of dance. And it's so interesting that you talk about being feeling like you can't dance. Because the reason I started belly dance was because I was getting discouraged from my classical training in ballet oh. because my body was developing and I had a big butt and big thighs and I was told by my teachers that that didn't look so good in a tutu and that I wasn't really built for ballet. Oh, and so I was kind of discouraged from it and that broke my heart. I just wanted to dance. I yeah, wanted to really? wear a sparkly costume and I wanted to dance. And as a young person, that feedback was, was a little traumatic, it you know, be. and it's not uncommon. That's, I mean, it's, I feel like the classical dance world is getting better now. But, you know, this was in the 80s. Sure. <laughs> so. and this, but this happened because it was ballet, you're saying? Yes, it was specifically ballet, oh and there's gosh. a very specific body type. And if you don't have that body type, you're not seen as really being able to progress in the art form. Oh. And that All was right. so hurtful to me. It was so hurtful. I just wanted to dance. But when sure. I was a teenager, I saw some belly dancers at a festival, and they were all different shapes and sizes. A lot of them had big hips, big butts. They sure. had longer torsos. You know, ballerinas are supposed to be all leg, and I'm all upper oh, body. I see. Yeah. yeah and sure. so, and they looked so beautiful, and they were wearing sparkly costumes, and they were dancing on a stage. And I was yes. like, well, can I do that? So my mom pulled out the yellow pages. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> this was the 90s. <laughs> and looked 
up belly dance classes, and I started taking three classes a week, hook, line, and sinker. That was oh, my dang. life. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, what's yeah. the story? I mean, so now you own a studio, mm -hmm. and now you teach. Mm -hmm. All right. What was the story there? What happened there? Yeah, so I feel like my, most things in my life, I don't make a lot of plans. I just sort of let things <laughs> organically, or, I know this is hard for Amethyst to imagine. I let things yes. organically emerge. Right. <laughs> like, right. And, you know, I was dancing, and then I had a friend who said, Would you teach me? And my mom oh. was like, Oh, would you teach me? And so I, I started teaching belly dance classes to my mom and one of her friends yeah. and one of my friends and had a lot of fun doing it. And then more people found out about it, and more people started coming and I was like oh I'm I'm pretty good at teaching dance okay yeah. and I just started teaching more and over the years you know we used to just rent studio space from other studios mm -hmm. have a class here and there we were all nomadic you know packed up my teacher bag took it everywhere with me and then we started being able to have enough classes that we could lease our own space yeah. but we've always been like sharing a studio until this past year this January we now have our very own space that's so awesome mm -hmm. I mean I'm glad that you that you've experienced this level of success that I was never expecting or necessarily right. looking for. If you asked me 10, 20 years ago, did I think I would be a dance teacher? Did I want to be a dance teacher? Yeah. I'd be like, oh, what? oh. <laughs> Maybe I don't know. <laughs> okay. Right. Did, but you so now? Did you start teaching before or after? Because cupcake, cupcake cabaret. Mm -hmm. I can't even say it. My burlesque company, cupcake yeah. cabaret. I really love an alliteration. You know, so do I. That's why I have purple pop publications. Purple pop publications. Pee pee pee. Say yeah. Say it sixty <laughs> times fast. Um, so that was pee pee pee. <laughs> yeah, you know me. <laughs> So, now you can tell how old we are. <laughs> yeah, right. If that didn't do it. So, so when did, was, <clears throat> did you start teaching before or after Cupcake? Yeah, so Cupcakes didn't get started until um, 2008, 2009. It was okay. right, right around then. And okay. I had been teaching belly dance. And then I had been performing belly dance um, on a lot of like the tattoo convention circuits in Denver, kind sure. of the alt scene. Sure. And um, happened to perform with a burlesque company as a belly dancer. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the woman producing that show was like, oh, I'm doing a burlesque show in Denver. I need some variety. Will you come belly dance? And I started doing oh, wow. that. And then I was like, well, what is this burlesque thing you're doing? Because this looks really fun. Yeah. And they showed me some stuff. I took some classes, and then I started doing it up here. I just was like, where well, I'm going to start my own burlesque company yeah. Fort Collins. Why, why the hell not, right? Yeah. And we started doing that, and then people were like, well, can we learn? Can we learn? So I was like, oh, okay, I could teach a class. Sure, yeah, yeah, sure. I could figure that out. Our first night we had classes. I think, like, we didn't know what to expect for the burlesque classes. I think 25 people showed up. Oh gosh! And we didn't. We were not equipped. We did yeah. not have a space big enough for that many people. We, I, I was not prepared. <laughs> Why is this popular? I mean, I can come up with my reasons, but you tell me. Why well, is this popular? You have to remember, around 2010 mm -hmm. was when that burlesque movie with Christina Aguilera came out. Oh sure. Um, burlesque was just super popular, trending everywhere. It was okay. like the pinup rockabilly scene was at its height. Right. Everybody wanted to be a modern pinup. Um, burlesque was getting the Dita Von Tees was getting all her traction. Sure. Sure. Like the scene was just exploding. Okay. And so I think part of it was just the right, we were on the right time, mm -hmm. right? But the reason I think it got so popular is because burlesque is so um, embracing of people from different walks of life. Yes. There's going to be burlesque much. performers performing until they're in their 70s. Right. There's going to be burlesque performers performing at any size. There's been a huge correlation between the burlesque community and the queer community. Yes. So a lot of crossover there. It's, uh, burlesque has been one of the first communities to embrace performers of different um, different stances. And sure. um, and then I think it's, it's, it's so accessible and it's so fun. <laughs> Do, do you know, I still, I haven't actually gotten out of that stage. You said it was 2010 and there was Yeah, you never moved past it. Yeah, I haven't quite moved past it. <laughs> I mean, I kind of hung out with the Rocky, with the Psycho Billy people yeah, in LA. Yeah, yeah, And it was, and that would have been, I don't know, two, I don't even know, 2000. <laughs> it was like 2000 that I was doing that. And I'm still pretty much going, God, I wish I could go back to the, but then I'd yeah. have to live in LA. Well, who wants to live in L.A.? Mm -mm. I feel like this podcast is just two middle-aged women trying to remember when stuff happened. <laughs> Do you know it totally? <laughs> well, I am not editing that out. <laughs> We're keeping it. You know, never, don't get upset at somebody who tells you the truth. That's... <laughs> Call it like I see it. <laughs> <laughs> right. So... 
you had actually mentioned you started in class with a classical. Yes. Ballet, you know, um, uh, modern jazz, okay. like the basics. Sure. Mm -hmm. Did, and you had to do jazz hands? Jeez. Okay, this is not. This I is know, not, this I know. Shimmer it is fingers. Not. I'm just. Jazz I'm hands just, is this. Oh, it's down. Oh, it's okay. Sorry. But everybody wants this to be jazz hands. So well, I see. I learned. I learned. You know. Yeah. I, you know. I, I, I put a shimmer finger in every dance it's I do. Nice. I love them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, do you have like a top hat too? <laughs> we do have some top hats in the closet. See, perfect. But in burlesque, you use shimmer fingers like the. Oh, I want to touch my body, but it's too hot. So oh, <laughs> they just shimmer oh, over it. Too ooh, it's too hot. It's too hot. <laughs> I, hang on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, you got it. <laughs> Look at you. You're hired. <laughs> Perfect. Now I have a new, a new career. <laughs> now I have a career, actually. It's time so, for a pivot. <laughs> right. So, you know, I actually, I brought up, because, um, you know, we're doing, we're doing the, and even I just did it, which I was said earlier, I didn't think I could dance. There I was doing shimmer. You just did it. You just did it. It's just your, it's you sitting next to me that's... <laughs> Right my bubble. It is. It's I your really aura overlapping. <laughs> I feel like I can teach anybody how to dance. That has been my credo from the jump. If you literally, if you have a body, you can dance. Like I said before, if you were a head in a jar, we might have some obstacles, <laughs> but we would just serve serious face. Yeah, right? really, sure. But if I mean, I've taught burlesque classes to wheelchair-bound people before. Oh gosh, like wow. you can. I mean, I feel like you can. Anybody who has a body can move that body in compelling ways. Yeah, and you know I. I agree. <laughs> and actually, let me ask this question first. Sure. I want to return to that because sure. I wanted to say, you know, the your approach to to teaching dance because mm -hmm. I mean you're even saying you can teach anybody, right? Yes. So what is the distinction then? Because I know a little bit about the classical style of teaching mm -hmm. ballet, not much. Mm -hmm. I'll just tell you. But how, how is your style different? What, what, what's the distinction there? The teaching style specifically? Yeah. A little hard to say because I, to, in all honesty, I haven't taken a classical dance class for, well, I guess I did take a few maybe 10 years ago. Okay. But I'm not, I'm not very familiar with what that scene is. And I do believe that that scene and community has made leaps and bounds of progress. Okay, And good. so I think that it's probably a much more welcoming experience than it was before. But speaking to what I experienced and what was so important to me when I started teaching was to, to have this idea of inclusivity and accessibility and to just be very encouraging. I recognize that here teaching dance in Fort Collins, Colorado, I'm not necessarily um, uh, uh, conditioning the next Rockettes, you know? But what I am conditioning is a group of people who will be able to get on stages and entertain audiences and enjoy what they're doing. And so that being the goal, it really, it makes everything just more uh, comfortable, you know? like. I, I don't need you to be perfect. I don't need your foot to be the exact same height as everybody sure, else. Sure. I don't need your hand turned in and everybody else is turned in. Like, I don't, I don't need that level of precision. I just need you to embrace yourself and have fun. And so that te when you're teaching to that goal, you get to have, I keep saying the word fun, but you get to have more fun with it. Sure. I mean, I'm curious. Do you think the Rockettes, they've got to have some fun, right? Or do you think it is really, no really 60 hours a week Bust in your ass. I mean, you have to love what you do. I'm sure that they love what they do. I hope so. But, you know, you think about the Rockettes, and there's, like, you have to be within a certain height bracket. You have to yeah. be within a certain weight bracket. Oh, gosh. You, you know, you have to do... You can't take a day off because your kids wanted to do something with you and you know it's 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 way more professional as opposed to and I and I, I hate to use that word because I feel like what we do is professional as well but there's a lot more wiggle room for being a human in what we do sure mm -hmm. which is kind of important because because we're actually human right who would have thought right yeah and and not everybody who comes and takes classes here has dance as their top priority you probably have yeah. another job you probably have a family you know right. you have other obligations and right. so this allows you to still have that experience of being a you know feathered bejeweled dancer on a stage but also allows you to spend the weekends with your kids yeah which is important <laughs> right so to re you know to return to what you had said before mm -hmm. um, about inclusivity, I mean I think that's I think that's important. Like in in the yeah. LGBTQ community, I mean there are really varying levels of comfort. Mm -hmm. I've been on many um, you know many transgender Discord servers, 
And there are people, that, I mean, they'll, they'll see their fingers and go, oh, that's it. You know, they got to go lie in bed for oh. a, a day, you know, for like a weekend, sure. you know, c- because the level of dysphoria sure. gets that, uh, you know, gets that, that um, what's the word I want to use? Like it's a black hole and you just right. fall into it and you can't get back out. You go, right. my fingers are... I got man hands, and that's... Mm, and the back thing forward. about a dance class is, I know you can't see, but there's a wall of mirrors here. And you're yes. standing in front of a wall of mirrors, me for hours every day. Mm-hmm. like, And you're looking at yourself in the mirror. And so for people who don't like what they see when they look in the mirror, it can be particularly right. challenging. But right. what we try to teach here is how to start to love the person that you see in the mirror. All right. Mm-hmm. Easier said than done. No, you know, <laughs> I would actually love to hear about it. I mean, what's, what is some of the, like, how do you get started on that? So I've actually, since you asked me to be on this podcast, I started thinking a lot about that. How do I teach people to embrace their bodies and their power yeah. and to feel confident and sexy? And I, after, I've thought about this a lot. <laughs> and I, I talked to my therapist about it too. <laughs> and I think that what it's come down to, I don't, I think the only way I teach that is by example. I think I model Gosh. that behavior. Yeah. I model those experiences. I my biggest thing is I always try to be so genuine and authentic and real with yeah. everybody yeah. and I share my struggles, I share my triumphs, I share my ugly thoughts, I share my beautiful thoughts and I I think that in people seeing that happening with another human right next to them, they start to feel like they can have that experience themselves. Yeah. Do you know what's crazy? That's more or less what I've done. Mm-hmm. I mean, and I've had I've had people tell me, "Gee, I'm just I'm glad you just exist," because mm-hmm. it tells me that it's possible. Yeah, just existing is enough. I would not have thought it was the same thing. I thought that that something like dance would be, you know, not one level higher, but like you yeah. know, logarithmic type level higher. And and it's interesting. I think it's I think it's that piece of leading by example and mm-hmm. I think that the other piece of it is that the community it creates that feeling in everybody mm-hmm. because community is like probably the biggest thing that we do here. Like yes, we are a dance studio, but more than that we are a community of people. And I think that when you come to a dance class and you see a room full of people that all look different, right? Yeah. And you see them being comfortable and embracing themselves, or you see them getting nervous and giggling and receding, you just start to feel like you can resonate with every person in that room, and we're all going to do this together, right? right? All the flowers blossom, or none of us do, right? So I feel like it just, that that sense of it's a whole group sort of zeitgeist that pulls you along. And so even if yeah. you're at the back of the pack and a little more reluctant, you're still going to get swept up into it, because you're going to just start feeling that euphoria of people loving themselves. Right. Right. It's hard. You can't. It's infectious. You can't avoid it. I would imagine. (laughs) Yeah. You know, it's crazy, too. I had actually written down as a note, gender as performance. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, is this going to go anywhere? (laughs) But what you're talking about is you have there is a social environment. I mean, I'm going to stick, you know, my academic Mm -hmm. horse shit, you know, terms on it. But you have a social environment and everybody is a part of it. Mm -hmm. And there are social expectations. Mm -hmm. They just happen to be positive ones. Right. The peer pressure here is, yeah, to do good things. Yes. (laughs) I mean, I got to tell you, there's like some of me is just going, I I didn't realize there could be positive social expectations. Absolutely. Hey, Sometimes I, look somebody at how will, I grew up. Oh my gosh! You know, we well, wouldn't be sitting here now right. like this. You know, but. I think for some people, they um, they think that they can't do something, and then they see other people doing it, and then those other people say, "Well, would you do it too?" Because like I'll have I'll have people peer pressure each other into performing. Well, I don't want to perform unless you do it. Will you do it with me? Sure. And then they do it together. Or oh wait, everybody else in the class is going to perform. I could do it. I could do it. Yeah, better do it then. Yeah, Yeah. I could do it, you know. That's awesome. Yeah. I can't, I'm, like, (laughs) doors are opening up, and I go, oh, my gosh. I'll have to rewrite a couple of things now, which I guess is good. Yeah. But, um... I am still trying. The other thing to wrap my head around that. That's really awesome. This is going to take a minute. You're right. (laughs) The other thing about like gender as performance, which I think gets interesting, especially in the world of burlesque. Burlesque is all about 
the aesthetic of burlesque is about hyper femininity, sure, right? Sure. Like when we practice our struts across the floor, we're walking the way hyper feminine women walk. Like yes. think Jessica Rabbit, you know, like that kind of a feeling. When we move, it's in these hyper feminine ways. When we do our makeup for shows, it's a hyper feminine sure. makeup. So what I find especially interesting when you talk about that gender as a performance is that burlesque has become a pretty profound vehicle to a lot of specifically trans women I know mm -hmm. because they can come to this class and they can learn how to walk more like a girl. Oh my gosh. They can yeah. learn how to move like, you know, I, I'll show you how to hold your hips in a more feminine way, yeah, right? Yeah. We'll talk about doing makeup in a way that is hyper feminine. Um, and so I think for a lot of, of people who have made that transition, but you know, nobody gives you a little um, tool basket, right? When you transition, yeah. like this is how you do it now. Yeah, right. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? There was, it was sort of, do you remember that TV show, The Greatest American Hero? No, I, never, I don't watch oh, a lot of TV. <laughs> Well, it was, you know, it you may not have been alive. Because it was, I don't even know when it started. I was super young. But it, mm -hmm. There's a dude, aliens come down, like you do. Aliens came down, gave mm -hmm. a guy a super suit, like a superman type suit. Okay. And he's, he go, he's like, okay, cool, you know, grabs it. And as he's walking away, the instruction manual <laughs> falls out. And so he gets home and he's like, uh -oh. you know, somebody says, well, how do you, how do you use it? And he goes... Yeah, I don't know where the where the book go. You know, it was mm -hmm. an instruction manual. Anyway, the point was, yeah, when I became the greatest American transgender woman, <laughs> no, you didn't have the instruction sheet. Yeah, they never gave me an instruction <laughs> manual. No one you know, one. <laughs> yeah, I went down to the to the courthouse and filed for a name change, and they didn't go, oh, okay, hang on, yeah. here's the telephone book. <laughs> I swear, they should give you one of my class flyers when you do that and be like, do you want to learn how to move your body in more feminine ways? I you should go take one of these classes. <laughs> right. I think you should do that. You should yeah. go down to the courthouse and just go, look, if somebody comes in to change their name and gender yep. marker, Here's just give them a pamphlet. Here, you yeah. know, this is the... Well, only if they change it to female because I, I, I do have some skill sets to teaching people how to be more masculine, but mm. my area of expertise is by far in the femininity. I would imagine so. Yes. I have had a trans man or two in my classes, and oh, they're really? usually okay. just in, they're usually just more gender fuck, and they're interested in just kind of exploring things. Yeah. But we do talk about like the contrast between this is the way men walk, this is the way women walk, and right. those contrasts. But right. but yeah, if you want to be, if you want to move in a way that is hyper feminine, burlesque classes are the way to go. Now I know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But, so, I'm trying, <laughs> fourth time when I start something, I swear the sentence will come out. It did, but I did, because I was trying to figure out how to get, how to, to get toward drag performers. Mm -hmm. When I was in graduate school, I don't know if I would call them drag shows, I don't know, because mm -hmm. I would do some karaoke, uh, I used to do Spice Girls Karaoke. Which? What was your song? No shit. Oh, wannabe. Oh, always, always and, wannabe. And I would write. <laughs> Come on. I would either do baby spice or ginger spice. Oh, okay. So faves. Yeah. Yeah. Well, ginger spice is always ginger spice. Uh, is very so much on. my favorite. She had the most fun. She did. <laughs> Everybody tells me, "Oh, baby spice. I love baby spice." Mm. And I go, "No, nah. really? Nah. <laughs> um, where the hell was I going? Oh, Drop. yeah. So I did. So I did some shows like that, and then you know there were lip sync type mm -hmm. things, more more standard drag type thing. But at the time, the intent was to was really to appear like a woman. Mm -hmm. And now I think drag has kind of gone into this. It it is, but I yeah. wouldn't even call it a hyper femininity. Sometimes it is. I think that's the thing is drag has become so developed that there's so many different facets of drag. Okay. Some people who do drag want to be perceived as a woman and are hyper yeah. feminine. Okay. Some people just want to be perceived as a performer and there's a lot of wiggle room in there, right? I think it really depends on the That's type of drag point. you're doing. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, All so, right. so do they, I mean, there's like, there's a whole subset now of like burlesque performance and drag performance called gender fuck or gender queer. And I don't know if I can okay. say fuck on this podcast. But. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Um, and that's that's like the you're not necessarily trying to present as a male or a female. You're just trying to present as glamour, right? I see. And so it could be like full lingerie with a beard, um, 
a very like feminine victory wave kind of hairdo yeah. and men's loafers. Like it, it does it's just whatever elements feel good to you and make sure. you feel glamorous. Sure. Yeah, sure. and that's been a huge movement. But there's still I feel like there still is that side of drag where they want to be hyper feminine. All right. Because mm-hmm. I, I guess anytime and somebody says drag kings. Yes. That's the thing now. Well, but that like that yeah. for some reason I'm okay with that. <laughs> You're not okay with the rest of it. Well, see, here's... You heard it here first, people. I know. I'm, I'm worried now, actually, to make this statement. But when I... Because when I, when I was doing this, it was... The intent was to portray mm-hmm. portray femininity. Right. And there are things that I see now that I go... It's almost a, almost like they're parodying femininity. Yes. And when I'm like... That's been a big discussion, actually. Are drag queens mocking women? See, the thing is that, like, transgender women are, are it's kind of a step worse because it's like, look, we're not, we're not that. Right. You know, we're, we're trying not to be a mockery of femininity. Mm-hmm. We're trying to be mm-hmm. a portrayal of femininity. And so, I don't know, I went to, I went to a show and I was like, oh, gosh, I, I got to go. <laughs> it wasn't for you. No, I, which I felt kind of bad because I'm like, yeah, it's got to support my community. But just because it felt like a mockery, is that why? Yes, yes mm. it was very much. It was, it, I, mm-hmm. you know, like I felt confession time apparently, but I felt I felt like almost personally attacked. Really? Yes, because I'm looking at people to because there it's it's oftentimes uh, I'm making a general generalization, but oftentimes gay men. Mm-hmm. And I think usually, I would say it's most commonly came yeah. Mm-hmm. So it was a generalization. Mm-hmm. But you There's know, trans women have been a part of the drag scene since it since it began. I oh, mean, absolutely. Marsha right. P. Johnson was the one who threw the brick, right? Yes. You know, so yes. I mean, trans women have been a part of the drag scene since drag was a scene. But I would say that when Marsha P. Johnson picked up a, a brick. Um, it was a different scene. It was not, it was more. It's a very different scene. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think either of us was there, by the way, when the brick was thrown. But speaking of being middle aged, just not that middle aged. Not that middle aged. <laughs> but I don't know. So I don't want to go on and on and on about it. Mm-hmm. Just, it's interesting that, that, I don't know, like there's a hyper femininity, but then there is not. And, and uh, I guess what I will say, I will, I will close this one out by saying, if you want to learn how to be hyper feminine, maybe don't take drag classes. Instead, go take... No one's teaching relax. drag classes. <laughs> No, <laughs> no, there's no drag classes. At least not here. I think drag Shit. is usually done with like a one-on-one mentorship. So typically, someone would take oh, really? you under their wing, like and an teach apprenticeship. You. Yeah, it's usually like drag houses, and you'd have like a mother, oh, like your drag mother. That's. Yeah. I mean, it, maybe it's changing now. And I am by no means the expert. I am sure. a cis hat female. Well, not hat. <laughs> cis female. <laughs> Fair enough. And so this is not my experience, but from yeah. what I, a lot of my friends are drag performers and they, it, that's how it's usually done is you get involved with an individual or a house of individuals wow. that teach you the ropes. Okay. I don't think that there's, I've never even seen a class advertised ever. And I've, I've got my fingers in a lot of these pots and I've sure. never, I've never sure. heard of a drag class advertised, not even like a drag makeup class, which would be so helpful. I learned how to do makeup, getting ready, sitting across from a beautiful drag queen and just watching how she did her oh, makeup. Sure. And I yeah. would just like sit there and like copy her. Right. Because <laughs> contouring, yeah. you yeah. want to know how to contour. Drag queens. Yeah. Absolutely. Because yeah. yep. see, when I was doing this, it was just, you showed up, people went, what song are you doing? And that was it. Yeah. Were you in like the full getup? Did you do like mm-hmm. wigs, makeup, dresses, all of that? Oh, I didn't need wigs. I had, because at the time my hair was like waist length and, you know, dyed black. So I went to this bar in, in Athens, Georgia. It's probably not there anymore. Bone Shakers, it was called. It's a great name. Yeah, it was pretty good. Mm-hmm. It was a good, it was the only place to dance in Athens, which is crazy. Mm-hmm. It's a college town. Mm-hmm. But it was also 1995. Yeah. 94, 95. Probably 95. What did I say? Middle-aged women try to remember when stuff happened. <laughs> You gotta, we got to quit using the term. <laughs> anyway, but you know, I, would, I would go there. I would have... The thing was, when I would go there, like, people responded very well to me, you know? Yeah. They, oh, they I'm thought, sure. And I would even wear... I don't know what that is. A three-inch heel? It was like a two-and-a-half, three-inch yeah. heel. Yeah. And I was taller than... You know, I've shrunk. 
becoming middle-aged. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, my point is that you know, I, I would go there. My hair was long, and I would mm-hmm. do you know, I, I was very gothic, and I would have Eye of Horus. Yeah, yeah. You know, oh, I can picture it. St- oh yeah. yeah, little spirals yeah. like death yeah. of, uh, from the Sandman. Mm-hmm. Um, where was I going with that? Oh, yeah, sure. So we show up. I would do, um, if we weren't doing karaoke, which, like I said, would be wannabe, um, it was uh, Susie and the Banshees Kiss Them For Me. Was my big song. <laughs> what a great one. <laughs> right, because it would, it would turn on, and I would make sure, you know, it's yeah. get up on stage and then make sure to, like, run back down the stairs when they turned it off <laughs> so that when the, the spotlight, sorry, yeah. So when they started the song, they put the spotlight on and go, where the hell did Selena go? What in the <laughs> flying head? And then I would, because that was my name then. And then I would walk up, because you, you remember how the song yes. starts. You know, so you really need sort of an yeah. entrance. This is going to be know. your first burlesque solo, I can is, tell yeah, already. Yeah, though I know. Kiss the choreography is already happening. <laughs> 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 so... Wait, in your mind or mine? Because I'm like, I don't know that it's, I, I, I... You're painting a picture for me. I can see this whole thing <laughs> laid out. <laughs> but walk up the stairs and then, you know, fake like you're singing. Kiss them for me. Which, incidentally, I could never hit... There's, you know, there's that one high note on you in every verse. And I could never hit those until just recently. Oh, congratulations. I know. How about yeah. that? It was really voice training. All I had to yeah. do was, like, find some way to learn how to use a voice Mm -hmm. son of a bitch I can use a voice I guess so who would have thought this went really far afield (laughs) uh where am I going with anybody I just drag okay I'm glad we had this conversation absolutely let's find another subject if you ever want to go to a drag show I would love to go with you but but I understand if it's not something you feel like is it was it was just hard yeah, it was hard because it yeah. it felt almost like a like a mockery of, of femininity, and when when I am considered a mockery of femininity, who's considering you that? Not you. I'll punch him in the face. Not here. <laughs> I don't know. You don't have to go very far on the internet oh. to find that. Everybody on the internet so, has a problem. Everybody, yeah, pretty yeah. much. But there is, I mean, in in the drag world now. There's been um, a lot more trans women who are drag performers getting a yeah. lot of traction. Like the last yes. couple of seasons of um, RuPaul's Drag Race have had so many trans women, a couple trans really? winners. Okay. Oh yeah, the winner right now is a trans woman. All right. And a lot of them, ta- some of them are very comfortable being trans women and doing drag, but a sure. lot of them talk about the experience of becoming a trans woman because they used to do drag before they became a woman, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And then and then making that transition and then. <laughs> feeling this dysphoria, like I'm now I'm pretending to be something that I already am. Like it's a, I'm sure it's a mind fuck. I can only imagine what a mind fuck oh, it is, gosh. but that's like a whole, a whole experience that a yeah. group of people are now, are now going through. Some of them yeah. don't want to do drag anymore. Some of them right. figure out a way to adjust their brain and still do it. Cause see everybody I knew and I can think of three people off mm-hmm. the top. There was one girl. Oh my God. I, I don't know how her body was so good. <laughs> I don't know who it's Cats, I, baby. <laughs> no, because she was where she wore where she would wear like a leotard, and she still had great hips yeah. and butt. I don't even. Well, usually it's pads like under tights, but maybe she just had a shapely body. You know what? Maybe she. Good padding looks like. I, you know what? You I can't clock it. Wore, it's yeah. like. Maybe she you have did. to push it to know. And please right. don't touch drag performers no, without their do consent. That. Right. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that whole, everybody I knew, so it was the three people I can think of in particular off the top of my head, were all, I mean, we didn't use the, the term because, you know, the word transgender was, mm-hmm. I, like, I didn't know it, and I don't know if anybody else did, mm-hmm. but everybody there was intending to transition somehow, mm-hmm. you yeah. know. I mean, it took me a few years after that to do so, mm-hmm. but, um, but yeah, everybody there that I knew was transgender. Right. So... So I don't know. I maybe I was in a uh, an isolated <laughs> event more than anything. Maybe but. you should ha- you should talk to a drag queen. Have you had a drag queen on your podcast yet? I haven't. I could I probably give you some links. Some people. All I know right. a few. I mean, I'd love to. 
I don't, you know what? Somebody's going to watch that. You're going to say, oh, go talk to this person. They're going to end up looking at this podcast and going, no, fuck her. <laughs> she thinks I'm awful. I'm not talking to her. I, I, if you want to make a connection, I'd be happy to introduce right. you to some people. I and think I, it would be fun. I think it would be a good perspective. And it probably would. You know what? I actually, this goes way the hell far afield. Yeah. But when I changed my, the name on my driver's license, mm-hmm. did I tell you this story? Yes. The woman who, Damn. yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and if you want to read the story, I'll just link it in the show notes. I won't bother taking up any time, but, um, I think part of it too, like for me as a woman, sometimes, and sometimes people, well, women can think of drag as mocking them. It's, I just have to know the intentions of the person. Like the drag performers that I know that I have the privilege of knowing are, they love women. They idolize women. They adore women. They're not doing it with any sort of, you know, anger, um, or they're, they're they're doing it as like a a way of honoring what they think is beautiful. Sure. That's not everybody. That is my little imagine. bubble, though. Yeah. That's my bubble do, of drag performance. Do you know what would be interesting, though? Can you imagine you find, like, some... I'm trying to think of, like, the most weird, fundamental... You get, like, some fundamentalist Christian <laughs> guy. Yeah. Nice woman hater guy. He's got yeah. the... Nice woman hater. Can I... Let me separate those two. But he's got, like, the, the, the wife beater shirt uh-huh. kind of thing. Ask that guy to do drag. Oh, isn't that like one of the senators? <laughs> is, oh happen? gosh, I think that just happened. You're right, <laughs> but I think that I think that. Yeah, would be well, awesome. I feel like I, I, for me, I don't know. I feel like that person might be mocking women and doing it disrespectfully. But you know what? I think that person would end up getting a very different perspective on what it's like to be feminine. Oh, sure, sure. And I think pretty much yeah. any man out there ought to get that perspective. Every man should shave his legs at least once. <laughs> as long as I don't have to. <laughs> no, no, certainly not. But, but there could be, oh, sure. gosh, and the person could get waxed. Yeah. And there you oh, go. Yeah. That's even better. Yeah. I Every waxed man, a male partner one time. Did you really? It was hilarious. On the, on the legs or where? Junk. Because I used to wax, because we were performing these little costumes, so I used to always do my own bikini. Oh, yeah, whatever. sure. Now sure. I got it lasered. I don't bother with that anymore. Right. But he would watch me do it, and he was always like, you, you don't even wince. And I was like, yeah, it's fine. And he's like, well, do mine. And I was like, you sure? And he's like, yeah. So I went, like, right down the center, like, oh, big yes. strip. Like, we were committed. It wasn't, like, just a little off the edge. It was, like, big strip. And I was like, you ready? And he's like, yeah, yeah, this is easy. I watched you do it. I mean, you could have heard the screams around the block. <laughs> And then he refused to let me finish it. So he just had like, no, oh. like two bozo clown puffs with like a landing strip in the middle. <laughs> oh my gosh. It was hilarious. How long did that take to grow back to? Oh, months. like months? Yeah. <laughs> it was months. Every day he got up and he was like, mm. oh, son of a Yeah, yeah. I had to get a new girlfriend. <laughs> He learned his lesson on that one. Right. Girls are tough, man. We'll just, you've been doing it your whole life. Like everything yeah. you do is uncomfortable and painful. So. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. I don't know. I thought, you know, when I first started shaving my legs, like when I did it regularly, was mm-hmm. in graduate school. And, uh, I, you know, people were like, God, the, you know, it looks like it would be, you know, like it would be kind of nice. I'm like, yeah, you ought to try it. And everybody I knew was like, oh, God, no. <laughs> No way. <laughs> like, I would end up cutting my, cutting myself on my knee. No. No. I'm not doing that. Only like, if you do a terrible job. <laughs> right. That's what I was hacking at your legs with a machete. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, what are you using a butcher knife to do this? All you need. To, like, <laughs> or, like, you're setting a timer. I have exactly seven seconds. <laughs> boop, 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 boop. <laughs> right. Don't do that around, you know, the, the, the genitalia area. But it's like it was anyway. I don't know. Men I knew went, God, I, that's interesting. I wonder what that's like. And I'm like, well, just go do it. Oh, actually, you know what? Maybe it wasn't I'm afraid of cutting myself over the knee. Maybe it was, no, that's for gay men and people like you. And swimmers. Might have been, and swimmers. <laughs> <laughs> and I, swimmers. I was calling it when I was running a lot. That's what I. That's what I would say. People go, "Well, how come you shave your legs?" And I said, "I'm a runner. What if I fall?" I, sure. I, 
think anybody needs a reason to shave their legs or not shave their legs. You don't have to validate that decision and I to don't, anybody. And I don't think anybody bought it. In, in the words of <laughs> India Ari, right? Some days I shave my legs, some days I don't. It just depends on whatever feels good to my soul, <laughs> right? So, like... It's a good point. Yeah. I should, I should have... I, I There's no have, rules anymore. Come on, do whatever you want. We've uh, Rules are out the window. There are tons of rules. I feel like those those rules of, of fashion and, and gendered fashion, especially, and what you should and shouldn't do with your body and the way you dress it, I feel like those rules are getting pushed aside by the younger generations. Thankfully, yes. Yeah. Thankfully. I'm mm-hmm. sorry, older generations, but when you're gone... We're all just going to be a queer mess. <laughs> I don't know that that's going to be a mess. I think that will oh, be Oh, no, it's going to be a delightful mess. Yes. It will be a mess of fun. Yeah, it'll be great. <laughs> the default is you'll just greet everybody as they, them, because you won't have any idea, and it won't matter. Right. <laughs> I think that would be great. I mean, I have some friends already who are like that, who are just like... Oh, yeah. A huge are... part of our community is like that here at the studio. It's oh, just whatever. Sorry. I mean, that the, the way yeah. they refer to anybody... Oh, is... Even with mm-hmm. even with he or she pronouns, yeah, there's don't, don't everybody is a they. Yeah. 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 And I, I got, I'm, st- I'm kind of trying to work on that because I, I, my stylist actually, my hairstylist is like that. And oh, I just refers to everyone as they. I'm yeah. Say. Yeah. And I didn't, the first couple of times it kind of jarred. And then I was like, oh, I see what she's doing. Does it make you is, uncomfortable no... to be they themed since you are so feminine? Like for me, when somebody they thems me, I don't even. Thank you. <laughs> She's beautiful. Come on. When someone they thems me, I don't bat an eye, but my, I'm very secure in my gender. I always mm-hmm. have been, right? But for someone who's transitioned, is that insulting? And you know, it's a vulnerable a question. question. You don't have to answer this. It just made um, me think of it. Actually, I did a show last night where it was, it was on Twitch, and you know, there's like a chat mm-hmm. role. You mm-hmm. know, people type stuff, and somebody said something about they, and then somebody somebody else corrected whoever it was. And I looked at that, and I and I went, mm, yeah, I don't know if I care. Yeah, and, I'm sure it's different for everybody. It is. See, when I the thing is that when I if I go out anywhere, one of the biggest like euphoric moments I had mm-hmm. recently is just sound dumb, but I went to the the grocery store with with my wife, and we get up to the um, you know the checkout mm-hmm. thing, right? And the guy, the guy's like, "Oh, do you have, do you have the?" She, he, he's talking to my wife and says, "Yeah, do you have the the loyalty program?" Oh, she's putting it in, and goes back to whatever he's doing. And I was just like, "I'm at the grocery store plugging in numbers," mm-hmm. but for some reason, it was a hugely euphoric moment, and I don't know that if he it properly gendered you. Yes, you yeah. And I don't know. I'm curious if it would have been the same if he had said, they. "Oh, they're doing it." Well, that's an interesting thought. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I, I were, I, you know, spent a lot. I fought a lot of years, you mm-hmm. know, to earn the right to say I am she, her. Right. So. Right. Don't let anybody take that from you. <laughs> no, because it was, it was a tough, it was a yeah. tough slog. Yeah. So, anyway, <laughs> we got so far. Out. <laughs> so sidetracked. <laughs> Do you want me? Let me. I'll try to bring it back together. But first, I want to. I'm running low on battery juice, so let me change out the okay. battery. Yeah. And uh <laughs> <laughs> We're back from our battery break. <laughs> Which when two women say that it can mean a lot of things. I know. What is that? <laughs> I'm not even sure if I wanted to edit that. <laughs> now. No, your poor wife. Because <laughs> it was, because it was, in, I intended just to pull out that first, you know, the last minute and the first mm-hmm. minute, but I don't know, the battery break. <laughs> so, so I want to ask you, so I have, this is going to go somewhere too. Okay. But I want to, because I think with dance, I mean, I think in general, the way that we start to, start to develop, um, I don't know, body positivity, I'm kind of trying to come up with a word for it, is cultivating this awareness, mm-hmm. like a connection between body and mind and self-awareness. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of making this shit up. Uh, what do you think? What do I think about that body positivity comes from body awareness? Partly awareness, yeah, that, that you've integrated body and mind in some way. Maybe. That's an interesting perspective. I mean, I think that to gain body awareness means that you have to spend a lot of time interacting with your body. Yes. 
And I think that in itself probably oh. feeds that relationship, I see. right? The right. more the more time you spend with your body, the better of a relationship you're probably going to have with it. I can see that, yeah. So I feel like maybe that kind of would go hand in hand. All right. The what I was thinking. And there's a bit of a coming out here. I like to juggle. Really? Yes. <laughs> My roomie just started juggling. Really? It's hard. It is. I So I actually got some, early last year, I got some clubs. Yeah. Okay. They're beautiful purple, like you do. <laughs> Surprise. Yeah, I know. Really? Actually, I may have bought them. Maybe I didn't buy them last year. Maybe it's been a couple of years. They're still purple. Leave it at that. There is a surprising amount of proprioception you have to get I mean, maybe not that surprising because you're trying to flip right. this thing right. and be able to catch it mm -hmm. after it's flipped in the right spot. Nobody can see my hand. But, you know, it's, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. And there are things I can do now. Like, my son threw a ball to me, and, and he was like, oh, I thought you were looking. And I go, what? And he was like, I didn't <laughs> even it. really see the ball. The thing was coming at me, and I just went, oh. Yeah. And I was kind of surprised. I was like, wow. I mm. And it, it lent a sense of confidence because now, mm -hmm. you know, I never wanted to throw, like, play catch with him. Yeah. Because <laughs> I thought, I know I'm going to get hit in the face. I don't right, wanna, right. I don't want to get hit in the face with a baseball. But acquiring a skill brought you confidence. Right. And that's sort of where, where I yeah. was going was that if, as, I, as I gained the proprioception, like, that was the important thing. Now mm -hmm. I'm like, well, I can catch a ball, you know. Right. And so it ended up you know, building this sort of self-confidence that I, that I think, this is what I think some of us lack. Clearly not us. Because we're well, not her. But, <laughs> but, you know, I think what some of us lack is the confidence, you know, to, to live in our bodies, to, to mm -hmm. inhabit our bodies. I don't know how right. better to put that. Right. Any thoughts? I mean... Yeah, I, I think that there's, and I, I was actually just talking about this the other day, trying to remember the term for it, and I don't remember the term. <clears throat> Hopefully someone in your comments will say it, because I'm <laughs> trying to remember it. And it's um, when you ask your body to do something, and then your body does it. So, like, if I tell you to hold up your right hand, you okay. can hold up your right hand, sure right? Can. Um, if I ask you to, like, make a series of hand signals, you're going to you're gonna take some practice, and your brain's going to have to get your hand to do it, right? Yeah. It's the, it's the you telling your body, I want you to do this thing. Oh, I see. It. And then your body, to... yeah, and then your body doing it. Yeah. So people who tend to be naturally good at dance or sports are people who can get an instruction in their brain and their body just does it. And internalize. You know, so like people yes. in a yoga class who are good at this, like in their first yoga class, they'll be able to do everything the instructor's doing because they get an instruction and they can just make their body do they the thing it's supposed it, yeah. to do. Yeah. Some people, like I have never been that way. I have never been good at taking an instruction and making my body do it. I have to fight for it. I always I have. So I feel like um, the reason I'm a good dance instructor is because I was not never na I was never naturally good oh, at sure. it. I had to learn how to do yeah, it. So right. then I know how to teach somebody else how to do it, right? Sure, I had to describe to somebody what needs to be right. done. Okay. But I think that so I think people who have the ability to make their body do whatever they tell it to have a certain degree of confidence. And I think the more that you can develop that skill, the more you can tell your body to do something and it does that thing, sure. the more confident you're going to feel about what your body is capable of doing. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. So, so I, I ask the question sort of as a lead-in mm -hmm. to, I mean, you must have people who come in here and their, their, first, <clears throat> their first class, they're very shy, they, they have oh, yeah. no confidence. Yeah. What changes have you seen? Oh my God, we turned them out. <laughs> that's, the, that's the joke. So yes, people will come to their first class in like baggy clothing, sure. very covered up, sure. back of the room, yep. just very small movements. And then, you know, by the end of that six week session, it depends on the person. Sometimes it's a slower arc, sometimes it's faster. They might be in little lingerie, front of the room, like doing everything as big as they can do it and just having the time of their lives. That's yeah. what we see. I see the difference in the way people dress. I see the difference in where they stand in the room and yeah. I see the difference in the size of their movements. Because something we talk about here a lot, especially because we are so female-centered, is the idea of taking up space. Mm -hmm. We are often conditioned to not, you know, don't spread your knees out, right, don't right. take up, be, you know, be conscious, get out of people's way. And so we kind of do the opposite in here, where it's like, I want you to literally 
and take up as much space as your body is capable of taking up. And so that's something that I think when people get more confident, they start, instead of their hand movements being like here, it starts to be like this extension yeah. of movement. So you see that as well. Do you get, I don't know how I want to put this, because for some reason I, I, I want to ask, you know, do you get people when they suddenly realize, realize that, they just go, oh my God, and break down? I've, we always <laughs> joke that our classes are like cheap group therapy. <laughs> It's, it's, it's an unusual week if someone doesn't yes. cry. Oh gosh, really? <laughs> yeah, I mean, oh, gosh. and it's you know between rehearsals and stuff. I would say that that you, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of emotions, and it could be as yeah. simple as somebody comes in and says that they had to put their dog down, and like everybody will just dogpile them and hug them and show them yeah. like so much love, you know. Um, or it could be things like, you know, somebody said something cruel to me and, you know, it came out in doing this, this dance exercise and everybody yeah. will surround them with love. So, I mean, I feel like we've worked so hard to create a space where it is very safe to have big feelings yeah. and it's safe to express them. And so people, people do that as well. And so sometimes we'll get those eureka moments too. I will say that a lot of times it's it's a bit more gradual, and then usually when we get most of those is after they do their first performance. We have student performances sure. every sure. seven weeks, and at the end of that performance, then they like when they run off stage. I always try to like be where they're running off, so I can like you know tell them they did oh such a gosh, good job yeah. as they go off. And sometimes they'll just be like tears down their faces, and they'll be like hugging me, and they're just they're just so overcome with all of these feelings. I can't even imagine what that must feel like to you. I feel, I feel a lot of honor at being able to facilitate and witness that process. Right. And I'd be lying if I didn't tell you I feel a huge slew of imposter syndrome. Oh, God. <laughs> like, I am I'm not a therapist. I haven't been trained to handle people's hearts in this way. And sure. so I always feel like, like maybe I don't. Maybe I shouldn't, maybe I, you know, when someone comes to me in a private lesson and tells me, how do I love my body more? And I'm like, this is outside of my pay grade. And then I'm like, no, it's not. This is what you do. Yes. You can show this person how to love their body more, yes. right? So it's, do, it's a struggle. Do you, well, I mean, <laughs> maybe dumb question, but can you imagine somebody sitting there with, you know, the cigar and like a clipboard? <laughs> What's that guy? And I was going to say guy, but you could might have, you might have some female. Sure. You know, she's got the big cigars. Mm -hmm. In this case, a cigar is not just a cigar. <laughs> but where the, what were we talking about? Oh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> like, what, how does that person know? Right? I mean, you, if you, I think it takes getting in touch with your body. You know? It you, does. It does. And I think that, you know, sometimes it's easy to fall into that trap uh, in our modern society of believing that I don't have the credentials or the prop, the formal right. training to do a thing. So I, right. I can't do it. But I, I feel like there's some validity to that. But I also feel like um, people will trust you with their hearts when they feel like you are trustworthy. And they and have deemed me someone who can hold right. their hand on this journey. Right. And who am I to say, no, no, I'm not qualified. Yeah. Agreed. I'm always the first one to say, this is outside of my pay grade. I think you should talk to a professional. All right. Can I give you some phone numbers? Oh, my but gosh. <laughs> I'm always the first. I'll say that when I feel like it's like, yeah. nope, nope, this is getting dangerous. I don't feel good about this. Right. You know? But right. for the most part, I feel like people, people should be able to ask for help. Where, where they want, where they feel safe yes. asking for that Oh help. my gosh, yes. Yeah. And that might be your dance teacher. I can completely see it of you anyway. Oh, you're sweet. No, it's not <laughs> even, I'm not even trying to blow sunshine up your lead. It's, you know. See, I used a dance term there. Mm, it was very... We don't wear leotards. We wear body suits. I know it. So that was way the... <laughs> That was like an 80s thing, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, it was. I mean, they still, they still call them the entire right. body suits is more common now. See, I'm, I'm, I'm accustomed. I'm thinking of like, you know, that Jamie Lee Curtis movie. Right. I think ballet, they would still call them leotards. But in burlesque, okay. it's body suits. Because sure. we're wearing body more lingerie. Suits. Absolutely. You don't, yeah. yeah. Yes. You don't want some of those leotard <laughs> crap. <laughs> Sounds terrible. We've also got a couple of students right now who are male students and who are not, at least not to my knowledge, are not... Um, exploring transitioning, but they have a very feminine side sure. that they don't feel like they get to express very often in their day-to-day -day oh, life. Wow. Yeah. And they like coming here and they like wearing heels and they like wearing sparkly clothes sure. and stockings and they like getting to dance sexy. Yeah. And they, they, you know, they, they just fit right in. Like no one here questions anybody. It's the beautiful thing about it. We're like, oh, you want to dance with us? 
here's your fish nets. Get in line. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think that's phenomenal. Yeah, I, mean, I think it is too. Sometimes it's a challenge like as a choreographer because I know when we first had a couple more men joining up, I was like, oh my God, everything, like we were doing Naughty Girl by Beyonce. Oh, we were doing yeah. My Coconuts by Kim Petras, you know, like everything was about like being a girl. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I was like, is this, does this feel comfortable to you? Does this feel uncomfortable? Do you want me to cater more? Right. And so far, I mean, and I've, I've had to have private conversations with each of those men in classes just to see, yeah. get the beat on what they're feeling. And they've, they're, they just seem like they're just really excited to do, they want to do a girly thing. Yeah. A girly thing. So they're like, no, this is great. I'll do my coconuts. <laughs> you know? I think that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, good on them. Yeah. There's yeah. no way that, that, you know, we should, we should limit ourselves to that. Well, and I think that you even said before, like, you understand that there's, there's this restriction in our society if you're a man and you want to wear a sequin top yes. or fishnet stockings right. or sparkly makeup or whatever it is, there's, society is really going to not be so kind to you in a yes. lot of places. And this is a place where you will be like, oh my God, you look so sexy. I love that eyeliner. Like, where did you get your fishnets? See? Like, it's... That's awesome. It's, and that's that's just so important to me. And I'm so grateful that that is the way the community has really developed. I can't imagine anything better. <laughs> I, I mean, honestly, I feel like you're, like you're just doing a, a, amazing work. Oh, thank you. you. Know, thank you so much you. For, for being, you know, for being, I'll just say it, you know, for being who you are, doing what you're doing. Thank you. That's the only person I know how to be. I always say that when people thank me for being me. It's, I don't know how to be anybody else. You think that sounds difficult, but, <laughs> but being somebody you're not is, I think, is extremely common. Yeah. So it, I don't even use a stage name. Like a lot of burlesque performers, most of them will use a yeah. performance name. I don't. I'm yeah. always Julia Deverdi. The, I'm always the name myself. Julia, though, I mean, works so well <laughs> on so many levels. Anyway, I'm branded. I know. I love the. <laughs> I saw the, the earrings I walked in. I'm like, oh, my gosh. I'm very branded. It's Although so I wore them wrong the other day, and they said DJ. And one guy was like, are you a DJ? And I was it's, like, what are you talking? Sure. Oh, shit. <laughs> Got him. No, I think, I think being the thing that's most important to me as a performer, as an instructor, and as a human is to be the most authentic, genuine version of myself yeah. that I can always be. And sometimes that means wearing my heart on my sleeve or right. being vulnerable or bearing right. my soul and... I'm I'm comfortable with that, you know. I'm uncomfortable. I'm comfortable in that uncomfortableness, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. And that's that's what each of us really needs to learn. That's mm -hmm. so much of, of a gender transition. Oh, I'm to sure. To become comfortable. Yeah. With the uncomfortableness of mm -hmm. everything, you know. Right. So. Well, Julia, we are. I'm looking. We're out of time. <laughs> I feel like we can um, keep doing this all day. I know. Gosh. When do I tell you some dance moves? What part of the podcast is that? I was really hoping <laughs> you wouldn't go, hey, look, let's move the table out of the way. And That's I'm gonna what I wanted to. <laughs> okay, we can at least do I our wanted to. I mean, sexy I already shimmer, did the shimmer fingers. fingers. Yeah, <laughs> you know, that's enough. So, so I just want to thank you so much. Um, I want to thank everybody listening. Um, I am Amethyst Deherrick. This is Gender Identity Weekly. And this week I was talking with the lovely and talented, very lovely, very talented, Julia Deverdi. Thank you so much, Julia. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And come take a dance class. And everybody, come take a dance come class. Come take a dance class. It's, it's so accessible. It really is. If you've just ever felt the desire to move your body, just come try it. it I've never had anybody go, oh, this was the worst experience. I'm so, I wish I had never come to classes. I know. I it might not imagine. be your cup of tea. You might do a session and you might be like, oh, it was fun, whatever. But most people fall madly in love with it because it's just so fun. so. It's so fun. It's loving yeah. your body and, and there's mm -hmm. nothing bad about that. Yes. So, yes. all right. Well, thank you again. Thank you.